Welcome to Biggest Geek Us. We are your hosts. I'm Randy. And I'm Joe. This is episode 11 of our podcast, and the date is Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Yes, and as of a couple of hours ago, we have 325 listens. Man, I wish that was people following us, but we'll get there. Well, it says on um, on uh, the most holy uh, anchor oh, that, yes. that we have an audience size of somewhere between 11 and 25. Dude, so, let's, I'm going with 25. I'm telling everyone we have 25, at least 25 listeners. Let me make sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Nice. That's the number on the web page. So, oh, 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 update. What? Update. Ooh. 26 um, listeners? Let's see here. <laughs> That's be? weird. One of the stats disappeared because it went up to 239. Yeah, it's probably because we had 5 million, five million oh, listeners jumped on immediately yeah, and, they're, yeah, and they're overwhelmed they're, the servers. They're being a bunch of lie bags. Bags of lies. Yeah, yeah, it's 325 and then, yeah, between 11 and 26. So it's uh, unique listeners. Uh, it has at 11 mm-hmm. and then audience size of 26, whatever okay, we, that means. I don't know. Uh, well, prop, well, who knows? Yeah, they have okay. a little thing there that tells you what they're their um, uh, calculation is oh, okay. based on, so don't know uh, anything besides what they say. Just what trust they, and believe them. They would never lead us astray. Yes. Yes. yes anchor is mother, anchor is father. So gaming wise, brother. We played again. Yeah. Suck it, man. We're on a roll. Yes. So two times in four weeks. We can actually be accused of being gamers now. We actually are, not just people who talk about games. Right. Uh, with um, They can accuse us with evidence. Yes, correct. Hey, so the New Valasia campaign, this is my Savage World fantasy, though the truth is it's a precursor to a West Marches game I want to run at home and at Cabin Con. Session zero, we laid down a few ground rules, made characters, I had a blast. Um, Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was kind of neat seeing. I think it was neat to see how many characters had some magic. I think your wife was the only one that was going non-magic at first. Right. Um, I don't know if the if if uh, Jeff's knight would have had any. I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not sure. We didn't get to see the knight. We he he uh, had two, and he went with his. His wizard instead. We had basically three wizards, and Joe's guy's kind of a ranger dude with some magic, and uh, his wife's playing a dwarven sailor, which I loved. Because you know, <laughs> I was like, that doesn't fit at all how the dwarves fit in this world. Right. That's perfect for a PC. <laughs> I am not like I am a drow ranger. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. I definitely overprepared though. Dude, I so, have so much, so much more crap than we got to. I was just like, kind of. Did we go off on a tangent or something? And, yes, and I missed a spot because you guys chose the whole, which was stupid. You know, when the skeletons were destroyed, that should have been obvious to me that you would track them. Oh, yeah. And I was like, no, I will not even figure that out. Actually, I know what's behind them, but I hadn't prepped it because I thought, eh, it's just going to be a random encounter. They won't know it's a big deal. And then, you know, Pat's like, oh, what magic? Let me check the magic out on the animation. And Jeff's like, let's track them back. And I'm like, oh, balls. Oh, midnight. Got to quit. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was late. We were ready to quit. So it was. It was kinda, I was really, really tired. It was very fortuitous. I don't know if you are, you guys could tell, but I well, was. Well, dude, you have a hard I day, man. Beat. Saturday's was, tough. Yeah. Should we consider Sunday? Nah. Okay. Saturday's going to have to do. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. What what is what's going to become difficult is that I've put in for a change in my um uh my route. Oh. A um a driving route came up, so I'm I went and I said, "Oh, I'd like to try for that." Cool. And we'll see if it works out. If it no. works out. Um, yeah. If it works out, um, they say that it's heavier. Oh boy! 
So it, it could be that um, it could be that I am working later. Oh, dude. So we might have to uh, uh, rejigger things a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to push it back an hour, but that's tough to come straight over from work. You need time to decompress, eat some dinner, get your stuff together, your brain prepared. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, you let me know. We'll keep it posted. We'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I thought it was pretty fun. Um, I think um, I think the key is going to be, like I said, I mentioned before, uh, we're using Savage Worlds, and the spells are pretty generic. Bolt, um, Entangle, Blast. And you're supposed to add trappings, which are descriptors, and sometimes they can have some effects. I think it's going to be vital uh, if people, and I think most people did, you got to pick, you have to trap your spells. Otherwise, it's all going to be super samey, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. Some of them are more challenging to add trappings to than others. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Or like the one that, um, the ones that I chose. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, one of them isn't hard. Uh I initially had entangle, right, and that's easy to to have trappings for for a rangery type dude. It's just vines or leaves or whatever, um, sure, naturey stuff. Um, but the boosting of your stats part, because that just happens internally. I mean, you could say you glow or something like that. Well, or I, turn I think green you... briefly, maybe something. I think the animal thing we talked about, I, th I think you should roll with that, where, like, if you boost somebody's smarts, you see, an, you know, a, a large owl, like a spiritual owl, uh, hover over them for a moment. Yeah, and then, that and are could, superimposed. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it, it could be something like, a, um, gosh, not the advantages, but something of the wild, like... Um, uh, Aspect. Uh, yeah, aspect of the wild, and so that yeah. can boost. That, that's cool, and even call it that. And that, you only have two spells. Yes. Well, oh, is two? Yeah, two. Just two. Should, okay, that's cool. Yeah, and I think I was looking up uh, the sorcery rules for Savage Worlds, and they're kind of not any different than a regular wizard. Um, but the truth is, I think. I think I'm really more, you know, I made a big deal about sorcery and wizardry because in, in, in Valasia, the wizards and the sorcerers had a battle and a big war, and the wizards were the trained ones, the disciplined ones. Sorcerers were summoners, and I'm thinking now more like demon summoners, and I called it soul magic. I don't know if you caught all my hints to all my connections to Supernatural, the TV show, but the idea was that, you know, uh, sorcerers tap their their souls but in terms of the game there's not much different if you look in the um fantasy companion the only thing a sorcerer gets that a wizard doesn't they can cast a spell at will i'm mean, not at will they have it free they can always cast a spell uh i think it may burn power points but other than that it's just a spell they get for free i don't know why and i'm not sure i'd go with that and so i was thinking what does that mean at will i mean well they cast i mean it. Right. So let me clarify. So in mechanics terms, I think it still costs them power points. I don't think it's a free cast. Does that make sense? Well, what you just said makes sense, but just but if you say they get an at will spell, but right. it still cost them power points and it counts against their Okay, erase that part. Spells. I I actually didn't say that because I never make mistakes. So therefore it was what I said the second time. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, um, they do that a lot in Savage Worlds. Like I noticed that, especially in the fantasy stuff, they'll give a race or a class like uh, one spell and give them five free power points to use it. So even though, you know, it's a special power of a race, let's say the race can only the race can only do it like, you know, five points worth per day. So um, I think that's kind of cool to have stuff like that. Yeah. 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 It was enjoyable. Like I said, I overprepare, which is good for next week. I'll be ready, but I am going to have to go and scramble to get that. I mean, I know what's going on in that building you guys left off on, but I've got to define it better and we'll be ready to roll. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the thing about uh, setting up uh, um, setting up your scenario. You know, your best play, bless your best laid plans. Yeah, really don't survive encountering the PCs. No, and and that's okay. I yeah. I think I mentioned a couple of times. I I want to be challenged, even if it's like, and I don't want to I don't want to railroad you guys. Um, the West Marches theme, and again, we're not running the classic West Marches, but 
it's, it gives players more control over what they do. And the idea is, and I really thought you guys would be off the island by the first night, by the first session. So they'd crash landed on, well, crash landed is a tough word, but let's just say they're stranded on an island um, and they're pretty sure they're close to where they want to be. But um, yeah, so uh, I thought we'd be done with it, but apparently not. Things take a little longer. And I think next session, hopefully you'll be off the island. Well, that's on you. That's not on us. That is completely on you. It's your <laughs> fault. <laughs> it's, it's our never. fault. We just existed on the boat that somehow spit us on a deserted island. Well, not <laughs> we thought it was, but it's not. Yeah. And at least it has skeletons on it. And, and you guys, I, and you didn't protect your rations and you didn't protect your water, so you lost it all. <laughs> um, yeah, that's our fault too because. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if we would have said, hey, before we get going on the boat, we're going to somehow fortify our rations and water, which we would have no idea how to do that. Correct. But, but if you, we, but if if you figured it out, it would have totally still been there. No, I yeah. would have still screwed you. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's fun. <laughs> but you, but you doing that, I'm not sure. I've been listening to a lot of, um, podcasts from this fellow who does prepping and and stuff like that he's not a nutbag but he he does talk about being prepared sure so it's kind of in the front of my my brain so as soon as you said we're on a deserted island your rations and your water are gone i was like well we need to find food and water first mm-hmm. thing so yep. uh, i wasn't sure if you I mean, you came up with a crocodile pretty fast for us to. Oh, I I had plans for that. (laughs) That was not a surprise. Yeah. Killed a crocodile and uh, um, strung it up. (laughs) Dude, if you and your wife had not made those notice rolls, it gets the drop on one of you. Ah, that would have been messed up. In Savage Worlds, the drop is bad news. It's like almost a guaranteed wound. Yes, definitely. And you only get three of them, so it's pretty harsh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, shall we head on some uh, gaming news? News. Not as much as last week, but we got quite a bit. Um, So uh, the first thing was um, something I felt about. It was a list of cool things on Bell of Lost Souls. It's a website. Um, I called it Fun and Annoyance with Swords. And they listed several things. The ones that stood out to me, and this is just a list of cool things they do with swords. I like the dice tray. That was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. Yeah. And, I like swords. Um, I think the dice tray might have been the only thing I would have been interested in. The uh, the, the initiative tracker was pre- would look pretty cool on the table. Yeah. But it might just be in the way, too. A lot of those doodads for me get in the way, but a lot of people like those, I suppose. Uh, well, it'd, be neat, it'd be neat if it was up behind the GM where everybody could see it right, and rather right. than on the table. Yeah, and the yeah. sword, the sword pen and journal is kind of like, eh. Yeah. And, um, the replica you know, I, swords, I never, there's, they're miniature too. They're not oh, full. were they? I didn't know this. Okay. Miniature as in, you know, holding your hand in the palm of your hand. I think, uh, well, I guess it's 39 inches, so maybe that's not really all that short. That's three foot three inches. That's a pretty good yeah. size sword. I didn't look at the price. So. Well, I was just thinking. It wasn't those particular. Like, you know, I have, um, I have a generic bastard sword that I got from, oh, gosh, where is that place where they, um, you go watch a show and it's n- jousting and, um, gosh, right. what is that called? So you've uh, been there and I haven't, and you still a couple can't remember. Of, a couple of three times. Um, <laughs> what the heck is that called? No, medieval times. Oh. Yeah. I've been to like Chicago and Florida and a few others. I took Debbie there when we went to Florida after we got married, and Madison was like three or four. No, she was five or six, and she got uh, dubbed a princess, and I got a sword there. <laughs> and then my wife got me a uh, Andoril, uh, the Flame of – is it the Flame of the West? And Something like it's, that. Uh, from the shards of Narsal, Lord of the Rings. We're yeah. nerd speaking here, but she got me a, a replica of that. That's pretty cool. Uh, guess which one I did not like at all? Can you guess? 
of all Which, the of all of all the all the things that were listed on the sword page. There oh, was hold one. On a hold on a so one. Are you are you, are you, are you going to, there? I have to go back and look because I bet you'll get. I, I bet you'll get it if you look at it. You. I'll be shocked if you don't look at it like a media and go, yeah, this is the one you hated because I bet you would hate it too. Oh, well, you know what I did? What? I totally. Don't worry about it. I'll I'll spill the beans. I don't want to waste time. Uh, um, it, it'll it'll be a moment. All I have to do is Control C and then oh, control, control V because I'm I'm a expert computer user. Yes, unlike me. Yeah, there we go. So Joe is expert right, expertly using here. the computer. You already said you like the dice storage thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which one was it? Yeah, number two. <laughs> Who does the number two work mask. for? Oh God, sword on your mask. Who? Oh, mask. We're in nothing, Michigan. Nothing in our masculinity like putting a diaper on your face. Yeah, we're in Michigan, and you know our governor is insane. So, but enough of yes, that. It's so. a very demented version of Simon Says. Yes, yes, yes. All right. You want to alternate? What you got for the next one, Joseph? Um, oh, the survey that I uh, had to uh, prop my eyes open up with uh, toothpicks. <laughs> um, also, well, I don't know if it's originally a Bell of Lost Souls. Uh, oh, no, no, it's 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 wizard. It's linked out to them. Yeah, they linked out. So yeah, yeah I got up to twelve percent of uh, completed and. Uh, Eyes crossed. So, Dude. yeah, <laughs> I did it all because I'm cool like that. Um, but it was a. It sounded very much like their last one, asking about how long you played D and D, more about setting. So I think they're trying to get ready to find out what they're gonna try to sell us next uh, in terms of settings. And uh, research. And it's okay. I, I didn't mind it. I did get yeah. frustrated though, and I had to speak my mind at the end when they asked me about things that would keep me from you know why I haven't played D and D in six to nine months. And I said honestly, it's because of Watsy's woke crap and their recent bowing to it. I mean, coming out and bowing to different things, and I just don't. I'm just not interested. I mean, you do whatever you want, company, but that's a good way to leave me behind. Right. Right. Um, telling good and engaging stories. Yeah. That's really what gaming is about. I mean, playing the game too. Of course. But getting caught up in current, uh, blending current present day um, social woes with your supposed to be escapism gaming. Uh, yeah. No thanks. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But it's about. I think it's like forty or fifty questions long if you complete the whole thing, and uh, it's interesting for a while. But it's nothing. They don't ask any really exciting questions you know 40 or 50 what are they what are they cracking the whip or something get in there and answer geek <laughs> i don't know man um now that's the, the 10 question survey it's only supposed to be 10 dude 10, not that's no that's five surveys in a row dude no you don't oh i don't know if you were around for this when they transitioned from first to second there was a paper survey in dragon magazine and oh, it was yeah, we like did that. it was like long. Eight, 80 or 90 questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did it as a group, though. And we did a group thing, and it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. We so sat around and it. On your computer is kind of. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, the next one, Star Wars. Now, at first, I thought it was a Star Wars property for RP, but it's more of some of their board game stuff. I don't know much about it. Star Wars X Wing, Armada, and Legion. They're leaving Fantasy Flight Games and going to Asmodee. I almost wish we had Patrick here again because he would know more about the, the the other game sort of stuff. I think Asmodee is a pretty big player along with FFG. So they're getting those uh, games and the rights to make games in some capacity. I don't know if it's also the RPG. Probably is. I think Fantasy Flight Games is getting out of the role-playing game business anyway. Well, what it is, though, is Asmodee. Uh, Fantasy Flight is a um, subsidiary of Asmodee. Oh, so, they have it backwards. It's somebody else then. Well, Asmodee has Fantasy Flight under it, and the other company that it, that this uh, that uh, um, that uh, this got switched to that start this, and it's not the whole of Star Wars. Oh, just okay. a certain, it's the miniature games versions of Star Wars. So 
Asmodee controls both of those companies. And, oh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, and it's just a reorg. So it's a reorgan- they're reorganizing oh, okay. how they do things, streamlining. Uh, they're putting all the RPG stuff under one house and all the miniature stuff on under, under another house. So that's actually separating the Star Wars stuff from each other under different headings. So instead of um, by IP, they're going by game type. And uh, huh. um, so to me, reorgs, and this might just be some management shakeup and um, or change. It may not be a shakeup, but it'd be just management trying to show it's doing stuff by doing stuff. And right. management, uh, upper management loves reorg. And uh, unfortunately, reorgs can also sometimes uh, preclude uh, layoffs. So oh, true. Considering COVID and different things that are going on, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we might hear a little later on down the line that there's been some layoffs. But it's not it's not for sure. Um, companies reorganize all the time, trying to optimize. Um, their business lines. So, so, so man, so that's like counting my, uh, savage worlds misstatement. That's two times already. I've been proven a liar, a false teller, and Joe has corrected me. Yeah. So I'm going to shut up and good night folks. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, man. I don't make mistakes. What's the deal? Well, it is possible that you, uh, read the, uh, the, um, the headline? And no, that's the, the problem. Already? That's just, the problem. Well, I skimmed it, and yeah, you skim. Yeah, if you if you're skimming it to see if there's any kind of juicy tidbits, you might miss yeah. the um, important Truth. facts, like the actual you facts. Asmodee. You see all the different um, company names in there. Yeah, but yeah, and my my brain just filled in the gaps, and hey, I was completely wrong. So what he said. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Interestingly, filling in the gaps was something that uh, we were at Bible study oh. last night. Yeah, and we were talking about heaven and hell as uh, you know, as far as the point of view of the Bible. Sure. And there's a lot of gaps because <laughs> it's not it's it doesn't specify with uh, details on what it is, where it is how big it is and all the, you know, well, yeah, I'm, what, what I'm not sure. Are. are there chairs? Are there bananas? You know, we don't know any, we don't know a lot of details about it. So to get, to get on the, on the Christian thing for a second. Now it does say a lot about fire and yeah. where the worm dieth not and uh, quench, you know, fire, water cannot quench the fire. So, I imagine hell was a pretty darn not great place to be. And so I'm going to work hard not to go there. Right. And whatever heaven is, it's got to be better than that. Cause well, gotta you know, be. Jesus be. will be there and God will be there. So sounds good. Right. I'm in. So, yeah, but I was just saying, because we don't know details, mm-hmm. we as human beings will fill in the gaps. Yes. Oh, you're comparing that to me filling the gaps in. Oh, Joe. Yes. I knew there was a reason I added you onto this podcast. So excellent. <laughs> your payment, your you will you have earned your paycheck. A dollar fifty will be in the mail. Yes, because when you were thinking about the podcast, you were thinking about all the people you could have help you out with it. And that was a, that was exactly that, what I was thinking. On yes. the bottom of the barrel. Yep. Because nobody I mean, hey, else I've made it really clear, Joe. I mean, we know. I'm the talent. That doesn't mean I work, though. I can't be working. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> What's next? What's next, Joe? That was a free league. Good, good, free league. Now, yeah. you know more about free league than I do. Yes. Would you like me to take this one? Uh, I can I can introduce it. Sure. Uh, the free league has uh, two different bundle of holding uh, offerings. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word. If it's, I would say Simbarum. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Simbarum. And, Simbarum. But, since I've been, but since I've been wrong, I shouldn't say anything. You, yes. You should uh, <laughs> put your finger. When I was in um, 
grade school, we would, uh, if everybody was being too loud, we'd have to shut up for a while. We had to put our finger over our lips, you know, to silence and they had to hold it there. Mm-hmm. The teacher said to stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, they've got, um, um, four, they have a bundle of holding with the whole game looks like, I'm not sure how many different, uh, books they have. Uh, but it's only 15 bucks for four ebooks, which is fine. Um, it's a good deal. I think I'm not sure yeah. how the bonus collection works. You have to offer a little more to get that right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how bundle of holdings work, but yeah, I mean, it'll be something pretty cheap no matter what you want. It'll, it won't be anything you could buy it on drive through for. There's no way. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of oh, into, it. yeah, you it's found n- it? just another $9. So, Oh, well, heck 24 bucks. Five books. Dang. You can't touch that. Not even for a PDF. That's awesome. Although it's weird, the bonus collection says twenty four dollars and ten cents, uh, and there's five books, and it says books valued at a dollar. What? Really? Yeah. So it wow. should actually only be twenty. Uh, oh well. <laughs> oh wait a minute, that's kind of poop then. Yeah. Oh, well, a do- probably valued at a dollar because they're on. Um, because uh, they're worth a dollar, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Because no knows? one, no one ever misvalues anything on the internet. That's awesome. But um, yeah. So the free league is interesting. They're doing a lot of stuff. I think they did. I don't know if they did kids with bike. No. Out of, from the loop, from the loop. I think is one of their first ones. And they got aliens. You know, I've got the aliens book. Um. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be doing a uh, a review of that. I'm I'm mostly through that. I think it's not crunchy enough. Even they say, I think in the blurb, they're on um, Bell of Lost Souls website. I think it's them again. I'm not sure. But anyway, it says it's kind of a, a dark fantasy, uh, but it's real close to PBTA, uh, kind of Warhammer meets uh, – Powered by the Apocalypse, uh, which is kind of a very light rule system. I can't imagine you would care for that that much. Powered by the Apocalypse, they have the moves and stuff. Yeah, and it's it's. Well, I mean, it's not just the moves. It's it's just pretty light in terms of very rules. Very light. Yeah, they. Uh, the only rules are the moves, from what I understand, right? God, well, there's well, there's a little more than that. It's been a while since I've read it, but I know they, they, I'm looking at the page now. It says it's sort of a influence or Warhammer, uh, White Wolf storyteller game, vampire and stuff. Those aren't heavy rules either, in my opinion. And then Apocalypse World. So, um, I, as I read the Aliens game, I'm thinking, yeah, this is not something you can really sink your teeth into rules wise, but it's definitely good stories. Um, I was thinking it was kind of funny. I wonder, I should ask them. I don't know if you know this. Do you know who the Free League is from Planescape? You remember that from Planescape in second edition? Free they were, League. Yeah. They no, were, I can't remember. Are they the ones who didn't want to be any part of any of the um, the whole faction thing? Uh, yeah, which is funny because they were, yeah, they claimed we're not a faction, but they were. And they're actually the Revolutionary League, but the Free League was their nickname. They were a faction in the City of Doors. Uh, I just wonder, I kind of wonder if they grabbed that name from there, but probably not considering it's a, what are they, a, a Dutch company or a, they're a foreign company from somewhere. But it's all right. Um, I know the Simbarum is a very cool and pretty book that I've seen. Definitely lush drawing, kind of, um, it kind of looks like, you know, people are out deep in a um, uh, deep in sort of a, either a fey or um, a fey realm and you're hunting things down that maybe things that man were not meant to know. There might be a Cthulhu type thing going on there, too. Uh, it's definitely got a super dark feel. Uh, I don't know if I'd call it gritty, but it's dark. And I don't know. The rules are uh, are kind of light, but I think the visuals are beautiful. And um, the only book I have is the aliens. And I can just say they're top notch on the art. Oh, that's cool. Uh, good art's all right. Um, I'm getting kind of, uh, I'm rules light. Everybody's going rules light. It seems yeah, right. And I don't know. Part of me is like, uh, I want to, I'm going to start acting like I'm sitting on my front porch telling kids <laughs> to get off my lawn and saying, what's so hard about role playing? You need light rules. <laughs> Wimps. Yo, you, you, you young whippersnappers. I, I, I 
in my day, we had a 400 page book and it was all rules all the way through. And, and we, we liked it. All, and we liked it. <laughs> if you didn't know it, if you didn't know the rules, you lost. <laughs> yeah. Kicked in the nuts. Crap. And a good GM would take advantage of that and screw you to the wall. Yes. And that's what happened. Yes, it did. So um, the next one is Traveler. Now, this is not something I'm huge on, but there's going to be a couple of, I think it's a couple of Traveler box sets. One is Mercenary and one is Fifth Frontier or something. Uh, don't play Traveler, but it's by Mongoose, so it's probably going to be a good product. Yeah, they're Downside. a solid company. And it said in the article they were taking, they've taken care of themselves through the pandemic, so they can offer this. Um, so I mean that's fine if you're into traveler. I think Eric, uh, Eric C at uh, Cabin Con, I think he's a traveler dude. I remember Traveler from back in the day when we were but kidlings, and <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this isn't that I don't think because uh, no. Mongoose wasn't a company then. No, I can't remember who originally had Traveler uh, off the top of my head. Some guy, a single guy created it. Yeah. The character creation <laughs> was <laughs> the best part. <laughs> Everything else was boring. <laughs> so yeah, it really was. What are we supposed to do? We're on a planet. Oh, I don't know. There's no aliens. What about There's freaking no... laser guns? You ain't got laser I, guns. I, I guess you're supposed to gather resources and get back to the ship. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Pinch poke. You owe me a Coke. Yeah. Dude. So, yeah. But, Chopper was not our bag. But uh, I did not know that Mongoose had that IP. So uh, when did that happen? Who knows? I, I want to say it was somewhere late in third edition era. They snatched that up. I don't know. I guess they've kept it. I'm not really sure. But uh, I think it's gone back and forth because I think I heard Eric Eric C. talk about Mongoose had it. He didn't like Mongoose's version. There's another version that came out. So there might be two versions out, a Mongoose oh, okay. version and something else. So I'm not sure. Okay. So um, Blue Rose, another thing I know nothing about, but I know Green Ronin's got some good products out there. Well, this is an age game based off their fantasy age game, and it's a second edition, I think, or a th- Second fantasy. or third edition. Age. Yeah, Blue Rose is considered a romantic fantasy RPG. What's so, age? What do you mean by age? Oh, um, you know, um, oh, what was the video game? Dragon Age? Dragon Age. Okay, that system. Okay. They Well, they pulled that out and they made a fantasy age, a generic right. fantasy. Right. And so they're applying that to the Blue Rose RPG. Um, not really my cup of tea at all. However, as a quick start... If you if you like the idea of blue what Blue Rose represents, you get a lot of crap. You get like nine pre-generated characters already connected. You get an adventure and a bunch of the quick start rules, and they don't shortchange you, and it's free. That's pretty good. Yeah, um, that is pretty good. I do think they must be a little on the uh, super feminist bandwagon because I Who looked at this. Yeah, so it's like I think there were four pictures of males one was a young boy maybe five and there's another one there might have been one or two of those four pictures let's see the, the boy was by himself laying down most of the pictures there with the females uh the characters you see first are all women representation of them and every almost every picture has got a female sort of doing the main thing and you know hey look whatever but you know, do you have to, I mean, compensate much? I mean, come on, just do your <laughs> characters. Don't think, oh, we got to feminize everything. Just just make your stupid classes. Quit being a, gosh, what, what do you call it, Joe? Woke what? Well, they're not necessarily being woke scolds, but. Oh, right. No, that's right. They're not scolding you, but it's just like, you know, why are you just kissing so much butt? I don't, I don't get it. Insufferable is yeah. what I call it. So that's when I will scroll down past. But I would I would say as a product, it's quality though. I mean overall, yeah. Yeah. it's quality. It doesn't interest me, but it's about romance and relationships in a fantasy setting and things like that. Which is whatever you want to do it, do it. But it's uh not my. I wonder if this was kickstarted. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Well, Green Ronin has a lot of uh. Pro- it's a fair. I uh, I don't know how it ranks. But uh, Legend of the Five Rings, that's Green Ronin? No. 
No, no, they did. Um, Green Ronin did. Well, they were actually a third party for the and they're in the big OGL days in third edition. Right. And right. they've grown. They've done mutants and masterminds. Mutants uh, and masterminds. Dragon that's, Age. That's pretty popular. Um, um, mutants and masterminds. So they probably were able to uh, use that popularity to do other things. This is one of them. And Will Wheaton did something with them, Titans something, Titans fall a few years, Titans something a few yeah, years ago. He, so, yeah. But I started watching that back in the day. Uh, I really gave him a big benefit of the doubt on that because I thought he, I didn't, I thought he was given a lot of, of uh, unearned scorn. And then I found out that he, went to Gen Cons a lot and earned the scorn. So <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Will Wheaton can do whatever he wants. I don't care. He can. And I won't pay attention to him because he's woke yeah. as well. Yeah. So then now Vampire the Masquerade, uh, including all the White Wolf stuff, I believe. Maybe not just Vampire, maybe. Paradox is a company that owned Vampire and made the fifth edition, which I don't know if you know about the big kerfuffle with a couple of years ago when it came out about them being kind of Nazi and alt right crap in their vampire book. And Oh, of I course, didn't hear about that. Well, it's, I've not, I don't know anything about it, but people but then got again, the, then again, yeah. <laughs> yes. Then again, you probably only had to have a male personage on your first book cover <laughs> to be called that. Dude, I, I think we have to apologize to the listeners. I think there's no way we can keep our political opinions completely out of this podcast. We remember we did the politics episode and thought we can get it out of our system. I'm sorry, stuff's going to irk us from time to time. And you know what? If you don't like it, you know, don't listen. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. So um, anyway, they um, that bad company, and I'll put it in quotations. I don't know much about it. Maybe it was bad. Has been they sold Vampire to Renegade Games who I think is going to keep 5th edition going, but um, new products. I don't know. I don't follow the World of Darkness. So. But it's something new if you're into it. It's something. It's a thing. Now, uh, we've got a new player in the virtual tabletop uh, huh. um, industry, and that would be um, a click, one click away. There we go. Mythic Table. Not for profit, which is always interesting to find out uh, how that works. Yeah, that's uh, what I was wondering. Maybe they're not for profit because they're not expecting to make one. <laughs> Could be that. <laughs> they might all have day jobs and they're just doing this to uh, because they want to have something, an alternative to the what's already out. Um, I haven't had a lot of time to delve into it. Um, it's not fully out yet. They're working right. on it. Uh, We'll never get any features behind what? We'll never gate any features behind a subscription. Woohoo! Okay, that's cool. Um, that might be one of those uh, value for value type um, uh, subscription models like we have. We don't have a subscription, but we don't we don't put anything. Not that we have anything besides this podcast. Right. right. We don't put behind put it behind a paywall or anything. No. Yeah, because it would stay, it, it would probably stay behind the wall. <laughs> yeah, the people would say keep. It there. <laughs> yeah, um, I, feel, I feel like I'm losing you sometimes here, Joe. Are you? Okay. Uh, I'm not I'm sure. Moving, what... I'm moving around probably. Okay, you're, so, you're acting like Randy. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm trying to get. I have to. Uh, I was getting my noggin close to the uh, monitor so I could actually see the words because I'm old. Oh yeah, I forgot. You're not young like me. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> by what? Two months? It makes well, all the dude, difference in the world. It makes all the difference. I mean, I'm a young man. You're an old man. I don't know what to tell you. Roger? Yes, I am looking at... <laughs> I'm looking at what's supposed to make this different, and um, so far it's kind of who cares. Well, we're not really. I just wanted to mention it because we got some people that are, you know, I know are some of our friends like the online stuff. My daughter and her husband play on Fantasy Grounds, right. and I know for a DM to have a full, you know, capabilities, it's a little pricey. But Fantasy Grounds is pretty cool. You pay once and you get all that crap forever. Right, right. I understand the need for it because people want to 
hide in their hidey holes, but still play the <laughs> game. And uh, um, that's not the way role playing works. Our our hobby is a face to face social hobby. It's not a. It, um, originally, these uh, virtual tabletops were were um, invented when you had friends who relocated to to far off places so that right. you could build a game together. Or if you didn't have a local game, you could find a remote game, and that was your you you know it's like last resort but this uh this does not in any way replace face to face it does not it's a it is a lesser alternative when you can't do anything else um I mostly agree. I, I think it really is. I mean it's not horrible and I'm glad people enjoy it. I find it weird that I think even before the pandemic there are plenty of people that no, it's not weird. We have a lot of a lot of you know we're there's a lot of geeks that are not great socially and um they have a hard time in face to face and so online's pretty good for them. Uh but I don't I guess for me I just don't get it. I'm with you. I mean I think I enjoy it more. I need it to be face to face. I can promise you that that Deadlands campaign we played lasted what, two, three sessions? Yeah. We had I a just, lot of problems. I just not. It's too much work. Well, if, different if, kind of work. Right. So if um, you play with your cousins. Right. I do. Over, which I haven't I for a month. That, right. I can see that why you would want to do that because yep. you, they're your family. I can see um, people you grow up with. Play play uh, role playing games and then you disperse due to life circumstances. Uh, a virtual tabletop would be great to keep those relationships going and that chemistry and all that stuff. But uh, it does not beat. I know people who traveled all across the uh, 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 the U.S. of A. to meet in Virginia to play once or twice a year. Um, mm -hmm. How far do they travel? That was your group when you were in Virginia playing with uh, your, your boy down there, right? Well, we had a local group, right. but he had some longtime friends um, that they um, they met sporadically, tried to at least once a year. They had high-level uh, first edition D&D &D, uh, characters. At that time, this was 15 or so years ago, the last time I was there. Um, and is it 15? Might be longer. Something like that. Anyway, um, so yeah, they would travel. <laughs> well, I, I forget the guy's name. How far, how, how far did the furthest one come from? I'm really not sure, but... Um, would they take flights? I think so. Dude, I would feel obligated to definitely provide a really good time and run a really long game for those sort of people. Oh, it's it was uh, always a, a, a weekend long thing. One kind of like our kind of like our um cabin con. Cabin con. Dang, yeah. I know there's a guy, you've heard of him. He's got a 38 or 40 year running campaign and I think he's either in Canada and people come from the U.S. to play in his game, or vice versa. So there are some games where people travel. I mean, I guess if it's good enough and you can't get your fix and you got a little cash, why not? Sure. I mean, right. if I was well off and I played once a year, and ca well, I tell you what, if I moved to, I don't know, way out west somewhere or north or into Alaska, um, God willing. I'd fly back for Cabin Con. Right, right. You're not going to go out west. No. Because no. you have tents. <laughs> yes, west. I will not go past South Dakota, so there you go. Right. I well, mean, I guess it's still technically west. Anyway, yes. What's yes. that? South Dakota's west, right? That is technically west. Yeah, I know. It's north. It's more northy. Something like that. Something it's over. Like, it's not it's here. Over. It's not here. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. 
I think that's uh, – no, we got one more, don't Ooh, we? One more. Oh, yes. This is cool. Uh, vote for your favorite podcast, RPG. Uh, if you follow the link that I'm sure Joe will put in the show notes, um, they're going to be voting for um, – RPG podcast of the year. There's two categories, actual play and the talk one. This is talk. Not that I think we deserve any votes. In fact, I don't think we could possibly hope to have that because that's crazy. But uh, if you're interested and you watch a lot of podcasts like I do, I may put a vote in. I got a couple I like. So, but uh, one of the reasons I'm doing one is because, well, they all, you know, none of them really do it exactly the way I'd like to see it. So there you go. Right. That's what, that's the whole deal. Instead of, uh, keep instead of me constantly complaining that all these uh, uh, podcast uh, RPG podcast hosts are lefty blankety blanks. Uh, stop complaining and do it yourself. Just like uh, games, if you can't find a game you like, mm -hmm. of all of the uh, all of this woke crap, either make it yourself, which is hard. Mm -hmm. or by Hackmaster, because it doesn't have any of that in it. Dude, that's, is that winning you over, Joe? Are you feeling the love? Oh, I'll probably run some stuff in it while I'm figuring out my own thing. Cool. cool. Or you could play play old games. There is nothing yeah. wrong with the older games. Or um, if you can find another unwoke game and pass it along, I would be I would love to hear about it. Well, some of the older D and D ones definitely were not. Um, Anything pre pre third edition, I would say no. Third edition, maybe. Fourth edition and beyond, eh. I don't know what what was woke about. Well, the only thing that was woke about third edition was their insistence on saying her a lot. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Him, that's a her, little him, bit. Her, him, her. I don't know if they did the whole. We have to have the same amount of hymns as hers, as far as pronouns. No, probably not. But. Uh, I know years ago it was an article it's like, what the hell? <laughs> I know. <laughs> whatever. You guys do you. I'm just not to think it's dumb, but whatever. We ought to. Um, a number of years ago, there was this YouTube video of this so-called professor doing so-called research about D&D &D and oh boy. coming to the conclusion it was completely misogynist and all kinds of other bad things. We ought to find that and then do a uh, mystery science theater uh, treatment of it. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, we could do that. And with the, I got the Jack trick, the Jack chick track with uh, Blackleaf. Right. We should read that on air too. My right. cousin Jason out there, Jason in Indiana, dude, he's got, he's got the sweetness there. I told you what he did at Gen Con one year, didn't I? You must have, but I forgot. Dude, <laughs> Jason bought the um, a, buck lo a bucket load of these tracks from Jack Chick. Anybody doesn't know Jack, he's I think he's passed away now, but his company made all these uh, tracks, Christian tracks, and they were pretty extreme. One of them was hardcore on D and D, uh, and Jason got himself a little like white collar, like he was a priest, put it on his collared shirt. And at nighttime, we're all playing out. We called it out in the mix. We were out with everybody else, you know, not in our rooms, just playing in the open play area. This is in Milwaukee. And he's going around and he's dropping these tracks off at people's games on the tables and saying, you're going to hell. You need to read this and doing it. And, and, and people getting kind of upset. And you know, he was being kind of playing the fake preacher guy. And they go and he goes, I got to go. And they go, what are you doing? He goes, I got to get back to my game. <laughs> But it was pretty funny, so uh, <laughs> that was a lot. He gave me a couple. It was pretty sweet. Thanks, JB. It was awesome. Oh, That's good funny. times. Yeah. Well, I think we should jump into the main topic, man. Yeah, this one's you because you're more of a GM than I'll ever be. But you have to be GM'd, so I bet you will be able to respond to some of my opinions. I will opinions. have opinions about this because <laughs> I have opinions about everything, and I'm not afraid to share them. Even stuff he knows nothing about. Sure, sure. I'll that make point. stuff up. Like, I don't know, point nine repeating equals one. That bothers him. Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> anyway, so new GM advice. Uh, one of our listeners and friends, uh, Josh Z, said he wanted something like this or how to build a campaign. And I thought I would start with advice. And uh, 
And I just listed things that I would probably uh, do. The first one I would say is first play with your friends. Uh, ones you can trust to have your back. You want as a new GM, I mean, you can go get a bunch of random people. I mean, that's how we all started. But in this day and age, there's no reason to do that. You can, I mean, if you're if you're thinking about GMing, you probably play. Now, I'm assuming you've played. That may not be the case. Maybe you want to start playing and then you want to gather your friends together. And if you do, get friends you can trust. You know, they're going to try to help you along and not just try to stab you in the back and ruin your game and act stupid and, you know, do silly stuff all the time that, you know, maybe you don't want or even just, you know, cause trouble and never show up. What do you think of that? That's good advice. Um, play with your friends and make sure you um, ask for uh, feedback. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to and, be. And, and, and if they want to, uh, you need to, you know, make sure you uh, do a package check and take a good ribbing if you deserve it. Oh, yeah. You have to be, you got to work on being a little bit strong because if you ask for, if you ask for a review, well, let's be honest, your friends probably won't. You might get one that'll tell you, but probably out of six people, I bet one would probably really tell you where you screwed up at. Yeah. What do you think? But, but you know, that's kind of good. As a young GM, you need some encouragement, but right. Uh, right. I think uh, your friends are the place to start. And I would also say don't bite off more than you can chew. So uh, my example is, you know, don't come to your friends and say, hey, I got this six-part epic campaign starting from level one, ending at level 30, and I'm planning to play for about seven years. How many of you guys are in? Yeah, that's, that's a that's bad a, idea. Yeah, it's a real bad idea because you're asking for a huge commitment. They've never seen you GM before. So little chunks, little bites, small adventure. I would definitely go that route. Um, I've Even never, see if one of your buddies has a module. There you go. Low and, I mentioned that later on. I, th I think, you know, there are there was a portion of people and probably still are that think running a module is weak sauce as a GM that, you know, it's a crutch. Um, I fully disagree with that. But in particular, I think it's completely OK. In fact, I would encourage a new GM probably to run a module unless they feel highly motivated to create all the monsters and all the scenes and all the stuff themselves. Yeah, it's better. It's better that you run some uh, canned scenarios so that you can get used to the rules. Um, Cause that's really, that's really what, that's what they're, they're best for is, you know, not, not learning all the rules and creating everything from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't, yeah, we'll get to that, but I definitely wouldn't say don't panic about knowing all the rules, but running a module, a lot of times, especially quick start modules and low level modules, they'll hold your hand through the process and tell you what checks need to be made and what sort of, you know, characters it's designed for. Um, if you're running 5e D and D, I hate to say it, but you can't go wrong with the DMs guild. There's a lot of third party modules that are short and very manageable and some are well produced. Have you looked at any of those? You, you probably never looked at any of those. Have you Joe? No, they're not getting my money. Well, it's, you know, uh, Watsy gets a tiny percentage. To, don't you have to pay just to do the DMs Guild? Isn't that well, a subscription well, thing? No, no, you can buy it. You can buy individual modules. I've done it. There's all sorts of crap on there. No, I mean, d doesn't, isn't the DMs Guild a subscription service? No. No, no, you're thinking of something else. This is just oh, a place okay. where you can get D&D &D adventures. You know, there's even like um, the the original uh, uh, Eberron, before it became a cardback book, they had an Eberron primer that someone had made. Um, it's, the, it's the community of gamers creating stuff that gets the stamp of approval by WotC. And I think WotC takes a small percentage of whatever goes on there, and then the creator gets the rest. Ah. It's 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 not too bad. I mean, uh, Savage Worlds has one too. Um, Savage Worlds has a Savage World. I can't think of the name of it. I've thought about putting a couple things on the Savage Worlds one, but I haven't got around to it yet. So I'm but, so uninterested in Fifth Edition that <laughs> I, while I I think I use DMs Guild to um, try to make a character. I know what you're talking about. You're thinking of D and D Beyond. Beyond. That's yes. different. DM's That's Guild works with drive through, I believe, and they sell you crap. You actually oh. get like PDFs and hard. I think you can maybe get them printed too. a lot of the adventure league adventures are in there. That's the uh, role playing game community that the Watsy runs now, but there's lots of others too. I mean, tons of adventures. Ah. 
Yeah, D and D Beyond is a subscription model. There, you're right. Okay, that's what I was thinking of. Either way, it's fifth edition. I'm really not interested. So, yeah, but I get what you're saying because because uh, drive through RPG is the same thing. So yeah, they usually have. I mean, they have all kinds of stuff there too. So now, if you're a new GM, uh, if you need players, to be fair, fifth edition would be a if you like it well enough, it would be a good system to start with. Sure, because, because there's, there's lots like, of people like it. Yeah. Sure. And your friends would be able to run out and find the books if they like it pretty easily. They wouldn't have to be hunting for it on the web or wherever. Right. And uh, they could you know easily find those. So that's one advantage. Um, I'm definitely now, an outlier. So um, I think a show topic for us would be a deep dive into 5e because we're such D&D people. I'd love to mention some things. And I wouldn't mind having another friend of ours guest star on that. I think oh. you can guess who that is. Philip. Big fan. Yeah, I think Philip. And I think Philip would be good. I think he would have some things. I have talked to him recently about some problems I had with 5e as well. We'll talk about that more later. But yeah, yeah I think it's a good choice. Uh, but the DMs Guild for sure. Um. And that's related to picking a system. So definitely pick a system that you like, but consider your players as well. I mean, if you really love something, you're like, man, I am a blue rose guy. This is wonderful. And you got a bunch of players that are, you know, butt cake, butt kickers and power gamers. And they're not about the relationship. They're about kicking in the door and beating the monster down and taking the treasure. I don't think a romantic fantasy is going to, you know, tweak their nads. No. So just the word romance. <laughs> Uh, like, Joe, I'm running a romantic fantasy at Cabin Con this year. I've already hit you in the nuts three times. <laughs> no, I think it's, yeah, you got to be careful. So I feel like we're picking on Blue Rose. Maybe we are. It's okay. Um, they don't pay us anything. No. So, um, yeah, I would say pick the system you like, but make sure you got players for it. Um, if you love the system, even better. If you love the setting, even better. But you know, don't get too caught up there. Just pick a system you like. Yeah. I would say do a one shot first. And I'm going to give advice that my um, my mentor teacher, who uh, when I was uh, taught high school, straight out of college, said he told me when I taught my first year, the day one, day one that I was going to teach, he said, promise yourself you will teach a second year. And I say, promise yourself you'll do a second one shot or adventure no matter the outcome of the first one. I think that's a strong piece of advice. Sure. You could another uh, source for uh, adventures to run are one sheets. You, mm. they, you can find for savage, a lot. for savage worlds. Yeah. And they're short. No, 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 no. This, you can get one sheets for all anything. Really? Oh yeah. Oh cool. yeah. They're not necessarily always called one sheets, but uh, you type that in a search engine. A lot of stuff will come up. One page oh. ad ad adventure. It's just a, a, it's a, it's a generic term for it's pretty bare bones. It has a map and a legend telling you what's at each location on the map that's marked. There might be some other details, but it's only one sheet of paper. It's only the front of it. One side. Uh, Joe yeah. dropping knowledge. I thought it was just, uh, I've, I've only heard, no, I have seen that I think before, but I mostly had it connected to Savage Worlds. I thought they had coined that phrase. Yeah, there's a, uh, I don't know how big it is, but I, I I remember looking it up one time and there was some kind of running competition on one sheets, but I don't remember all the details. And it, yeah. it didn't have anything to do with Savage Worlds. It was all okay. fantasy and, you know, it's not connected to any particular system. It just has, like I said, a map and a legend, orcs, and goblins, maybe a dragon or whatever. And then you're free to see this is what maybe a newbie may not like because it's not like it's holding your hand or telling you what the stats on anything is. It just tells you what's there. Well, true, but you know, when you say – now, we're talking about two different, ty different types of new GMs. Now, if you're new to the game system, if you're new to role-playing, it's a little bit different. But if, you're, if you've been playing for 25 years and you're going to bite the bullet in GM, I think you could probably allow yourself a little more freedom. Uh, sure. pick stuff. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you can be brand new and you can say, hey, I'm going to run um, Storm King's Thunder for 5e. Let's go. You can do it. Um, I think now here's something I think not everybody agrees with, and, and it may not be possible, but I do think this is better. I don't I think you should play before you GM if possible, especially these days. Um, 
Now, that's not always possible. And of course, you know, I didn't have that. I, actually, I played before I GM'd. Sure my did. cousin, my cousin Rodney ran me through a game or two before I ever grabbed right, a, not a, a whole screen. lot. No, th- two or three times. Yeah. Oh, well, no, you were running then too. You were oh, doing I, some current things because I know Gary ran a few things that you yep. played in uh, rather nefariously. I might well, add. <laughs> Are um, you saying harm doesn't have range? Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I tell you the truth, um, but I had DM for at least one year, if not two, before I played under Gary. So, oh, okay, okay, yeah, because I, I, if you, you might recall in Gary's basement, it was you and Gary, Robert, Eric, and I think JD was there too, and I started off as a game master. Oh, okay, yeah. So, but I, I do think in this day and age. I think you've never GM'd. Definitely play a little bit if you can. Now, mm-hmm. some people have the bug. I mean, I'll be fair. I had just learned the game and played a little bit, but I was I was going crazy. I definitely had the bug. I knew it immediately. I wanted to create stuff. I, you know, built this god. I don't know, three or four level dungeon. You know, the Sea of Fire, and I had all these I mean, fire buttloads of rooms created. I was into yep. it. You know, I spent time on that. And granted, it's nothing to write home about, but it was uh, my first real big sort of campaigny thing. Yeah. But um, I, I think playing first is ideal. But if you can't, you know, you do what you got to do. And by, somebody's got a GM. So sure. Sure. Yeah. And some I, of the modern GM guides have good advice. Oh, much better than when I was. Playing, oh, yeah. Starting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because the G the 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 DM's guide from D and D told you to be uh you know take great delight in destroying all the players, <laughs> their characters. Uh, hold on, bad uh, advice, very uh, bad uh, advice. Um, okay, I think I can get this quote because our friend Robert loved us. Mm-hmm. The DM taking the DM takes. I think he said you should not take, but I can't remember. Maybe it was the unholy delight. In, in killing endless hordes of player characters. Yes. But I think I think he actually told you not to. No, but, no, but, no. Oh, uh, no. I think so. No. But Ga- okay, Joe. Guy Gag said, Guy Gag said to take unholy delight. <laughs> Nothing not take unholy delight. He wouldn't have said unholy delight if you said, no, you shouldn't do that. Yes, he would. He likes that phrase, unholy delight. <laughs> or I should say light. Um, so another one is make a... Uh, cheat sheet of rules, uh, I would say, and when I say that, I mean, okay, my first adventure looks like the players are going to be, like, you know, on uh, our Savage World, they're going to go sailing on a ship. I kind of knew some of the sailing and the swimming rules, you know, I had an idea of them, and right. I, if I was if I was worried that you'd actually swim, because I had a more nefarious plan, I would have <laughs> I would have had them jotted down or the page number. I knew where they were and be able to access those quickly. You know, if you're going to be going on, uh, if you're going to be climbing walls and trying to escape this keep, you should know some things about climbing and how high you can go and what happens when you fall, you know? Right. I think it's helpful to do that. Um, Sticky notes are good, but I like a little sheet on my screen if possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now one that I, I got this recently, and I'll be honest with you, for years and years, I was one. I would plot out adventures. Hell, I would plot out campaigns, and I would have them. I mean, this, to be true, the, to be honest, one of my favorite campaigns, um, The Seven Spheres, I plotted the heck out of that. And I don't know how great that is, but everybody, I mean, I mean, you call you played in a lot of it. You enjoyed it. I mean, I had a lot of yeah, people yeah. that really enjoyed the Seven Spheres. So I'm going to say this uh, from the Alexandrian. He said, um, "Just is it Justin Alexander, I think." He said, "Don't prep plots, prep situations." And I think, in general, that's really good advice, just so you don't railroad too hard. But I would say, if I was playing under a new GM, if it was a little railroady, I don't think I would complain. Right. You, um, as a longtime player, if I get a new GM, uh, someone who's not like my wife. Well, no, she had been. But for me, she was new. When right. we first got together, after we got married, she GM'd a little bit. And for me, I had never sat under her as a GM before or DM. Uh-huh. Right. So I just was one. I was. I just I was just going to be helpful. I mean, she's my wife anyway, so that's the good idea to be. But um, um, 
I think it's good to, as a player or a new DM for you to be helpful. But props to Jen. I played at the game store at least once, maybe another time with her as a GM. And she, you could tell she had GM before she knew what she was doing and what she yeah. was, what she wanted uh, mechanically. And, and it seemed like at the game store when we did it, she didn't really care too much. She just, I mean, she didn't get bogged down in her own rules. She just let the players know their character rules and she did her thing and it worked out fine. I thought it yeah, was good. It worked out great. Great. Lots of fun. And that she put together a multi DM session. Really? I'm trying to at the Remember, game store. You're talking about for my birthday? Yeah, yeah. So you were running a game? Hmm. Bob the ran sto- a game. Right. The story and wasn't she, Link. He she she just had multiple it, GMs to run games with you in it. Right. They were all, they were loosely linked because okay. I as a player ported between the games. Oh, that's right. That was cool. There was a connect it was loose. But still, but it was still there, and uh, she coordinated all that. It was pretty yeah, cool. She, it was good. She that was quite a present. We had a blast. Yeah, yeah. But the don't the prep don't prep the plots is this idea. So, you know, you don't say okay. So the players are gonna come to uh, the town of Sanctuary. They're gonna head to the Vulgar Unicorn. They are going to talk to the bartender John. And he's going to tell them they need to go to the sewers. When they head toward the sewers, they're going to get jumped by these uh, thieves. And the thieves are going to uh, then force them down an alley. And at the end of this alley, they're going to end up getting beaten and thrown down into a the sewer to go down uh, and fight the rats. But coming through back, not the way they meant to, but eventually they'll come back to where they meant. The idea is if you, if you prep plots – you're going to force your in your mind, your players got to go A, then B, then C, then D. Even if they have a couple of choices, it's really not choices. And you have this idea of how things are going to happen. I think it's better off to just prep situations. Okay, they're going to come to Sanctuary. Someone's going to mention the vulgar unicorn. And then when they go there, they'll meet the barkeep. If they talk to him, he might tell them about this situation in the sewers. They might do that. They might do something else. They head out to the sewers, and this gang of ruffians jumps them. They might kill all the ruffians, and it may not happen. you got to leave it loose. Just, pro- just prep situations, not the full plot. Right. And if, if you're planning on leaving breadcrumbs in the form of rumors, you might just have a list of rumors. And yep. then – listen for what the players want to do and drop those rumors where they go. Yeah. And and I think it's interesting. I think this is where I think you're good, good foil for me, Joe. I'm a, my natural inclination is super prep master. I try to prep every little thing that I can and be ready, not for every situation, but just have, I've got a lot of, I have to have a lot of meat when I serve dinner because otherwise I'll feel like I don't have enough for everybody. Whereas I think you, Joe, when you run, you're more of a, almost more of a bullet point guy. Yeah. Is I'm yeah. Bullet point is a good way to put it. Cause, uh, you need to know, but you need to know what it's hard to know what to prep. Uh, when you don't know what the players are going to do. However, you Mm -hmm. do know, um, what this overall overarching story scenario is. So it's easy to come up with a few NPCs, a few rumors, um, map out some locations, and then just jot a few notes down and then see what happens with the players. Because once the, once the players hit the scene, you never know which way they're going to go. I mean, some players are amenable to you. Just They just wait for you to tell them what to do. Yes. In fact, some want that. Some want Some, that. They want you yeah. to say, well, where's what's the hook? Next? I'll bite. Right. What's next? What's next? Right. That's fine. That's one way to play. Nothing uh, wrong with it. No. Uh, another way to play is to dive in and act like you're in the middle of it and figure out what to do from there. And, you yeah. know, honestly, I think as a new GM, you know, you may have to – I would think most new GMs would probably lean toward prepping – because they're nervous about failing, which is a shame. You shouldn't worry about it. So you're having fun with your friends, but they probably would lean toward prepping. But after a few sessions, you may find, dang, I did all that work and didn't need it. And you may very be very extemporaneous. You may be surprisingly good at with just a few notes, man, you weave a great adventure, you know? Right. And uh, 
that's the module is kind of the linear what's next kind of fodder. You know, if people, yeah. who, people who like to just, you know, what's next, I go there. You know, whatever you have for me, I'm just going to do it. And, and, and if you tell the group, hey, I'm running a module and, you know, and say, look, and, guys, yeah, yeah, and, set, and, set people up. yeah. And say, look, it's going to be kind of, you don't have ultimate freedom because we're trying to tell the story or you don't have to. But, you know, there's always going to be some jackass is going to be like. Okay, the princess comes to you for help. Huh, huh. I uh I tell her, Hey baby, you wanna go to the bar with me? You're like, you're gonna be a complete jerk to her. She's the princess of the kingdom, she slaps you in your face and leaves. Right. But I mean, or you're like, you know, just do something stupid. I stab her in the back. <laughs> awesome. You know, that's yeah. kind of pretty dumb. But linear is fine, but you do gotta watch so a, a module can be fairly can be linear. Uh not all of them are, but you gotta watch the railroad. I think yeah. that's something a, a new GM is going to be very hell. All GMs, I am very susceptible to the railroad. Um, I, however, am more lenient in terms of I don't consider most people consider railroads anything where the players don't make all the decisions. I'm more like the railroad is where you don't want the players. We turn left, can't turn left. We turn right, can't turn right. There's a door in front of you. What's behind me? Concrete. Right. <laughs> Where are you going? Through the door. That's yeah. a railroad. That's a problem. Yeah. The railroad is the D it's, it's a story time and the DM is the storyteller and you're just along for the ride. Now, to be fair, the railroad can still be fun. If when you open the door, there's some cool encounters, but sure. you're not, but you're not making a lot of decisions. It's more like a video game. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would also say another thing they should do is go easy on the world building. Um, for your first game or first couple of games, um, try not to get, and again, I say this as an experienced GM who loves to world build, don't get too caught up in this guy was the, uh, brother to the Archmage. And then you start telling about how, how they grew up and when they were born and why mommy liked the Archmage better than him. And he holds this resentment. You can get caught up in a, in a deep, deep, get caught down into a deep, deep rabbit hole and write all this crap that has no bearing on the game. Right. Right. Like describing the session it. in hand. Yeah. Describing, um, how uh, this one particular dish is served in every uh, inn in the land. And you go into detail of who, uh, who developed the recipe and where the ingredients come from. And there's a song yeah. about it, the elves made and yeah. yeah. That, can get some, a, that can get a little bothersome. <laughs> or even something as simple as like, you know, the group heads to the city of sanctuary and they plan is to go to the bar. They're probably going to go to the bar because that's what characters tend to do. And then you get, get yourself caught writing all about all the different factions in the city, not just the ones connected to the bar that they may meet, but all the people in the city and whoever the ruler <laughs> is <laughs> like, yeah. Oh dude. And I can catch myself doing that. Oh, I can do it easy. Okay. So there was a situation we were playing and there was a, a young waif on a mm -hmm. dock that yep. our party glommed onto, and we absolutely did nothing else but deal with the imaginary situation of that waif. We had no idea who that uh, it was on, in one of your games. Oh, and one of the players just said, "Oh, we have to help this little girl." And oh, with with the demon horse. I don't remember all the details. That, that's the one that had the horse that was a demon that was in the shape of a horse. Somebody's horse. Yes. So there was this little girl we had to save. And then <laughs> it wasn't enough that they were delivered from the particularly dangerous situation or whatever they were involved in. No, nope. uh, no, it wasn't enough. The whole, the whole scenario, I mean, not the whole scenario, the whole evening's play was um, the girl. Yeah. And that's, that well, was, was no good. That wasn't well, your. That wasn't your plan. That's just, you know. Well, it's, well. To be fair, I um, I did encourage it because you know you know me. I can get into role playing. Right. And I was kind of into the roles of the girl and what was going on, and I was inspired. And you had a hand in it only in the sense that you you were I think you were the one that said something about a demon or demon problems. But it was a thirteenth age game. We were just getting our hands under players using a little bit of narrative control. Yeah. And I, it was meant to be an introduction to the story. It ended up being the story. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's kind of open world, in my opinion, gone wrong. I, I yeah. think it can be. I think there were two or three people that enjoyed that session, and the other two or three, not so much. Right. 
I think about 10 minutes in, I was done. I was okay <laughs> with, uh, yes, little mm -hmm. girl, we helped. We set her on the right path, moving along. <laughs> right. <laughs> the moving yeah. along part never happened. <laughs> do you think, though, to be fair, do you think that was because you're an experienced gamer and you knew, and with me in particular, you're used to me jamming. You're like, Randy's not doing this. This is not the part of the adventure that he really has spent time on. We're doing other stuff. No, no. Right. So I, uh, I knew to the core, this was not the, this was not the thing. Right. Um, had it been another GM or DM and I wasn't, I don't think I, I can't imagine any of the folks we normally game with where that would be the thing. But if okay. I thought that was the thing, that would be, I would have words. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> you mean or anything, but I'm like, dude, you have, you have a sack? <laughs> That's not an adventure. No, it's not. It's just RP, RP, RP. RP, 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 RP. If anybody's guessed, we're not like crazy role players. Joe, less so. Uh, I forgot. How, how did you get on uh, story? You got storyteller, but you didn't get much, much on method actor, or did you? No, I did. Actually, oh, wow. the only thing I got low on was casual gamer. Everything That's... else was like 40 ish. It was like even spread. Yeah, mine was 63% method act. No, 63% storyteller, 56 or something method actor, or maybe backwards, because I can get into character and I can role play, you know, selling, buying grapes from a vendor in town. <laughs> I can if it's functionally part of the story, or right. if, if it can be a kind of a funny aside that lasts for a minute or two. Right, just a quick little exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say this, too. As a young GM, when I mentioned don't worry about failing, you're going to miss parts. You're going to mess up rules. Hell, I still mess up rules. Um, I don't I, think anyone that matters is going to care. No. Nor should they. No. Nope, nope. I, I because, think, you know. Um, you know. Because if you're, if you're all friends and go back to step one and make sure you try to have your, your friends or friendly people around. Um, we all should know that rules are easy to uh, mistake or misinterpret or forget. So uh, yeah. Okay, Joe, I'm a, I'm a new GM. All right. My first time I'm your buddy and I'm going to run village of Hamlet. Okay, this is an old AD&D really? module. Yeah. We're, playing, we're playing, and you come to the moat house, and you got to jump over, jump on these uh, stones to get into the moat house to get to the, the edge because it's broken, the bridge is broken, and yeah. there's these giant frogs hiding under the water. And so I say, make a jump check, and you're, and you're like, and you're like uh, I forgot, how do I do that? And I'm like, oh, I forgot too. Um, my advice would be to make a call. The older I get, the less I want to look up. I'm doing it still out of habit, but I think it's a third edition habit I've developed that I didn't have in second. I'm getting tired of looking at, looking up rules in the book. Yeah, it can be annoying. I mean, I, I really, I'm almost, we don't play enough for me to call this at my table, but if we played, say, Savage Worlds for a year, and we saw no end in sight to the game, we're just loving the hell out of it, I'd kind of like say, look, let's not look up crap in the book. You know, if we forget a rule, I'm going to say, make a check, target four, go. Yeah, yeah. Or it's, or it's hard, really hard. You have to get a raise. Go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I just don't want to futz with it. And I would say a young GM, if a player knows the rule at the table immediately, an experienced player, probably wouldn't listen to them. Make sure they're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes, but you may not be able to tell that. But if they don't know it immediately, don't look it up. Just make a call. And if you can't think of nothing, 50-50, roll. Right. And so what do you think of that? Or would you rather that young GM pull the DM's guide and look up the jumping rules? Um, the only change that I would put to what you said is if nobody at the table knows what the rule is, go for what you just said. Oh, but okay. Let's say one person says, oh, yeah, that's that. And it sounds reasonable then do that. I agree. I agree. 
So if uh, you're the new DM and you say it's a jump check, I can't remember how to do that. So, oh yeah, it's a dex check. Uh, uh, depending on difficulty, this uh, if it's supposed to be easy, it's this. If it's difficult, it's that. There you go. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. As long as, long as you as a DM don't take umbrage at a player telling you what the rules are. So if you're, if you would rather that not happen, you say, no, no, I'm just going to do this my way, but and I, and then fine. Okay. We'll do that. I don't know why I did this, but Debbie noticed this. When I transitioned to third edition, the couple of guys I were playing with, they were spending times with the rules more than me. I had read it. I read the player's handbook thoroughly, but I didn't, I don't know if you remember, I had a little trouble with the wizard getting the five foot step and I thought it was, you know, oh, cheese yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. a couple other rules. I had a problem with a tax opportunity at first. But um, I got to where I started to rely on those players and just them making an argument. I kind of gave in a lot. And I think I've become more of a I don't want to call us. I'm not a slave to the rules, but I worry about getting them right more. And I think we have a sub segment of players in our vast group that really like the rules. And my heart, my heart really doesn't. And what I mean by that is the rules are great, but they're nothing but a framework. And I know how to tell a pretty cool story. Just trust me. Sure. And so is, though, we can. Because we've played a long time together. You and I can. We can. I can have whatever you say I'm going to do. Doesn't sound right by the rules, but okay, fine. I'll do that. I won't even I won't say that. I'll just go with it. Plus, you'll tell me after, you know, I think that's wrong. And we'll look it up and like, oh, dude, I hosed you. I'll fix it next time. Yeah. Th- those, that, and that's how, that's how friends, uh, that's how friends um, do at the table. You just mm-hmm. let it go. It's no big deal. So, yes, not married to the rules. Don't yeah. be married to the rules. The rules are there for the framework, like you said. And I probably hold the rules a tiny bit higher, maybe. I don't know. Maybe just different. Well, I think I think as a player, you almost I don't say you have to, but I think players tend to because they need to know how they operate in the setting. And a young GM making calls just because he's young, he doesn't mean he can't use simple logic to make calls. And I think players at the table, no matter how experienced you are, you need to give that young GM that chance. Sure, just let sure. him make it. Even if you really disagree, don't bring it up. It's his first time. Let it yeah. go. Yeah. You know, but some people can't. Because, yeah, because the call, whatever you have to do, if he says roll a particular die, it's probably not going to be that far off from the rule anyway. No, unlikely. Very unlikely. And um, well, my last piece of advice, I want to wrap this up is, and I don't know if you, I thought it was kind of funny, but I think it's great. I don't think you want to, I don't think you want to, over prepare, but more importantly, don't read too much GMing advice. You do both of those. Oh, I, you do I mean, both of those. as a new GM. Oh, 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 no, seriously, I know it sounds funny and I'm being hypocritical, but not really. Because for me, I'm working on trying to get better. I read GM advice. If I read a book, I'm hoping to get two or three snippets that I can take with me. Um, and I prepare hard because that makes me feel comfortable when I sit down to play. It doesn't mean I've set you guys into this perfect railroad from which you can never escape. It just means I've got a lot of tools. You know, I've got lots of monster scenes. I've got a lot of NPC scenes. I know the the flow of what I'm hoping to head toward, you know, even when yeah. you guys, when you guys went, went off track this past Saturday night, I wasn't lost. I just didn't have the stats fully ready. I know hmm. what's there. That's not the issue. Off track. Hmm. Off the railroad track. Correct. Because I really hate it when you guys do that. It pisses me off. Stay on the track. <laughs> My story is really good. Follow it. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have signs up. This is where my story is at. I turn left. Joe, read the sign. Oh, my bad. I turn right. <laughs> Very good. You win. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think it's about all I got for new new GM advice. All I want to give them, dang, that's about 12 things. That is. That is. Hopefully, they'll remember at least one. Yes. Hopefully. Right. Hopefully, I'll tell, hopefully you one what, more. I'll tell you what's memorable, though. 
What's that? Chab and Khan. Dude, you are segging like a madman. Segging away. <laughs> yes, Cab and Con is memorable. So, um, yeah, speaking of Cab and Con moment, um, what do you recall? I want to ask two questions. First question is, do you recall your first time running at Cab and Con? And did it feel special or was this another game? Well, it's not like we've had candlelight or anything like that. <laughs> Come on, we could, though. A nice little dinner and Chianti sure. and fava beans. Sure. Flamethrower, too. <laughs> um, honestly, let's see. I'm trying to remember. There were several I didn't run anything. Yes, you were you were, you were were a loafer. You were a moocher. Yeah. He played. He did not it's run. It's another word for being a player. I believe. Uh, I be- yeah, go ahead. Can you? I don't remember. Can you? Oh, can well. You- do you oh, think, I can. Do you remember when I ran the what I ran first? Um, no. You ran first. I remember How's, you running an arena game once. Yeah, you're very selfish. You should be remembering for me. <laughs> you would think that I would do that. Yeah. Well, my first time running kind of links into my GM failures. <laughs> um, <laughs> dude, Cabin Con one. I created this. I thought would be about a probably an eight or 10 hour LARP, not really a LARP, but we kind of had role playing and factions. So people were moving around the cabins, making deals and it turned into the whole weekend. Yeah. It that did. Was, and it wasn't that good. And I had, remember I, I did stop and ran table versions of scenes where you had short adventures and I ran, I think everybody through that. And I was essentially, I think John Terrell ran something and mm-hmm. I think um, Trombley ran something, and that was it. The rest of the weekend was me doing my one game. Yeah, that's where the um, 5D6, uh, Phil, Phillips uh, 5D6 fireball complaint <laughs> comes from. Not from my uh, game, from John's from game. John's game, yes. <laughs> that particular, I'm pretty sure it was that particular uh, cabin con, that first one. And he pulled out a 5T6 fireball and did 28 damage. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and my, my, um. But the LARP, dude. That was just, that was a, that was a, that was my first gymming. And I don't know what I was even thinking, why I thought that would be so wonderful. But I mean, I didn't push it through many days, but I hadn't planned for it to be all day, but it got out. Of, I didn't control it well enough. Okay. So what people were at that first cabin con okay trombley bob grr was i don't know if greg was kelly kelly k came scott me and you josh john i think philip was there Mm -hmm. and brian i think that was it okay so greg d may have been there Maybe, maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we had, I could always, well, he's not around to defend himself. Um, yeah, don't, don't bash anybody. Don't bash anybody. No, no bashing. I'm just, my thinking is, my first thinking was, it was our first cabin con. We didn't really have an agenda. Right. We showed up at these crummy cabins with some food and our gaming gear and said, what are we doing? <laughs> okay. What and are we doing? Who's running? <laughs> so did you, did you plan the LARP by yourself? Um, no, I had some help, believe it or not from Bob's wife, a little bit with some ideas. I had this, I don't know. I don't know why we had done. So I think Bob had remember at the house, Halloween, Bob had ran kind of a live action thing where I was this yeah. Duke. And Deb yeah. was my daughter. It was really cool. And I think I got I got the bug and I ended up doing a crazy story like that almost in my mind. I, Not as right. good as Bob. I don't even remember the details, but what I do remember is it was a lot of hemming and hawing and pseudo political crap um, from the point of view of factions warring against each other um, uh, with words. It was really just kind of. Um, 
if I were to do it over, I, the story was good. I remember liking it. Yeah. I would have given you guys factions. I would have given you about one hour to make deals and then come and have each faction come to me and tell me, tell me what situation they have. And then I would let anybody give me notes if they're doing any sneaky stuff. And then I would have run my, my three adventures, you know, where I, I sit you, where I sit you guys down and we actually roll dice and fight monsters. Right. So I wonder, and that would have probably worked out great. Yeah. I just wonder if, um, that suffered in a way from the same thing that ended up happening with the Elysium campaign in that we all went and did our own thing. So you had a lot of cooks. But from a player perspective, because you yeah. guys had you, I gave you free reign. And as you know, you must keep players on the rails. Right. Because they don't know what they're doing. You right. have to control them. Yeah. But that's <laughs> not what happened. No, you it didn't. Fly off. Do your thing. Be right. player. And we just, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I could tell it was about 30, 40 minutes in. You were kind of like, dude, can we get on with this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Leave it to Joe, baby. He's got. Joe loved it, I think. Oh, I think he loves he loves politics. Don't forget. Yeah. Yeah. That's his thing. So, yeah. So I would say as a my first time running was poop. <laughs> it was just a, hor a horrible, great plan. I still maintain it was a good idea. It just was horribly run by me. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I only remember your – the first time I remember you running at Cabin Con was that arena where I played my little halfling sorcerer who came in second every time he was in an arena. Yeah, I think mostly – I think uh, I think that's the only thing I ever ran. Uh, that's a, the first thing I ran was that because um, – That was, really, a, that was I, a Lake George. You didn't run to Lake George, you wuss. Had you to run things, <laughs> I don't need to worry about that stuff. I just have <laughs> have characters show up. Shut up. <laughs> have characters will travel. Yeah, shut up. Dude, I, Let me play. Dude, I had one cabin con out of the 14 where I didn't run a thing. There was one where I didn't run. Or maybe you I did? just, I don't, I think so. I, maybe I just had one where I only ran one game. There was yeah. one year where I ran very few. <clears throat> Right. But usually, usually I'm running once or twice a day. So. Right, because I know we've had um, you, um, we've had discussions about more people running games. Right. But for my part, I never complain about lack of games. So that's true. There, that's it, true. So people mm -hmm. harping about lack of games or not being able to get into a game, something like that. And he who then, shall remain nameless, Mark. He uh he complained incessantly and never runs. But so, so the he's a player, right? So the if you don't think there's enough games, then run one. Mm -hmm. Went from that to everybody has to run a game. I'm like, no, right? We just have to have enough people running games that Correct. want to run games. Correct. That people want to run games, but those same people who don't want to run games shouldn't complain about people not running games. Absolutely not. Right. So that's why I never complained about it. That's true. I mean, I'm, I was only joking. I mean, I don't, I don't care. You didn't you run. Know, but some other people were like, they didn't step up. They didn't step up. I'm like, what? Yeah. I, and I don't want, like I, one of our new, new guys, Larry, Larry E, he uh, is planning on running at some point a 13th age game, but I don't want him to feel like he has to. I mean, we've right. got at, at this point, you know, Larry in and me and Dave, you will and Phil will. Um, who else? John, John A is a beast running games. Josh will run games. Jeff's yeah. run one pass. We got, we got not nine GMs. Even yes. when we have 20 people, that's plenty of GMs. And then there's people who <clears throat> break board games. Yeah, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, um, Plenty to do. No one should complain. If you if uh, you don't like uh, the fun that you're having, you don't have to come. Oh, and don't forget Jason H. Two years ago, Jason ran like a crazy man. Remember that? No. No, dude. He ran like I want to. I want to say he ran for two of the three days. He ran every slot. Oh. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. That's right. That's Cthulhu, Cthulhu, right. and some other stuff. Yeah, 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 he did. Yeah, that's right. He was a beast. Um, then the, now, so that's, that's letting things get out of control and overwhelm the con. 
Right. Another one, and this is more not just first time, but some gymming failures I just thought was interesting to talk about. It's always good to hear failures and successes, so maybe I'll talk both. Another failure was my infamous Star Wars game. I heard about that. I didn't get the yeah. chance to play in that. Well, that's because I was gone for six hours and barely got through half of it. Right. So don't plan too long, young GMs. You got you to gotta time things. You know, if you're going to run a four-hour slot, you're probably looking at three or four scenes, significant battle scenes, and then call it good. Right. That depends on the uh, system, too. Absolutely. Three or four battle scenes in 3X means uh, 12 hours of game time. True. Dep- <laughs> depending on what level you're playing. But yeah. 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 This Star Wars game I was planning on running was a full-blown module. And the players were there and they came and told me, how long is this? And people are coming up two or three times. How much longer you guys got? I'm like, I don't know. We got about, you know, two, about a third of the way to go. They're like, you've been playing for six hours. And I'm like, what? Cause we try to limit to three or four hours cause we don't yeah. want to Bogart. So you want to, especially at cabin con, that was a fail. I think the game was good. We had a good time, but hell we could have played into midnight. I, that game easily could have lasted another six hours easily. Well, see, and that was good. That could have been good fodder for you're looking at the clock. Oh, I'm coming up on four hours. Think of a good place to break it off. And then you reconvene. Since we're there for several days, a few days, you could easily reconvene and pick up where you left off. I don't know about a particular cabin con if it was, you know, wall to wall games and lots of people. And maybe that wasn't a possibility. That was a Phillips house. That was Phillips cabin con year. So we didn't have that many people there no. at that point. So no. you probably could have, especially after we had some people leave because of some uh, home issues. Uh, we were probably hurting for a game at that. I don't know when that happened during the, the weekend. So I don't you know. recall either. Um, so do you remember any? Well, I don't want to call anybody out, but maybe we shouldn't. I think that's good enough. I don't know if you, if you yourself have any gymming failures you'd want to talk about. Um, I yeah, think the, the, the failure I will, will admit to is introducing uh, the strange to Cabin Con. <laughs> oh, that's not a failure. We had to try. Yeah. We thought- I, honestly, we had fun. Yeah. But because we're friends and when we play games, we, we play off each, each other's uh, quirks and um, strengths. And uh, uh, I think we have a good chemistry. Uh, I agree. So it doesn't necessarily matter what system we're running, yeah. but uh, the failure was me kind of diving in too fast. That's um, probably something, uh, <coughs> the new GM advice we could maybe, I don't know if it's actually part of it, but don't support a gaming Kickstarter and get every piece of gaming material for that game unless you're committed to it or yeah. if you put it, commit yourself. But you've <laughs> got to watch that because if the game ends up being not your cup of tea, I'm not going to say that the strange is a horrible game. No, but it, it just ended up not being my thing. Yeah. The whole cipher system. I mean, we talked about it before. It just right. wasn't our bag. It, it's just like, um, um, Rifts. Oh, okay. Yeah. In, in, in that, uh, The Strange has a great story to it. But the implement, implementation of the rules, I didn't quite like after playing yeah. it a little bit. It just uh, seemed a little... The same way. Yeah. I think even more so because the Rifts storyline is really cool and really flavorful, but the... Uh, especially the, uh, was it, was that Steve Jackson? No, no, you're thinking of, um, Palladium games. Right, right. But Rifts as a system is kind of a hodgepodge of rules that yeah. I don't really care for all. I mean, there's p- pieces and parts that are okay, but as a whole, I don't really care for the rules, but the setting is really cool. What do you think of Savage Rifts? Oh, that, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. So See, we that's, only played that's in the one future. time. Right. So I'm not sure. It's Savage World. So I, uh, Savage World's rules, um, it scratches my uh, rules light itch. Yep. It's a, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm, I wouldn't commit to Savage Worlds being my only game. No, no, but I need some variety. It's fun. it's fun to pick up, play it, some Savage Worlds from time to time, maybe a short campaign can be fun, but it wouldn't be my permanent game. 
Yeah, it's but, it's, it's really not right now. I'm into it, but it's not my go-to game. I don't think it won't be over, over the long haul. Yeah, but the Savage Rifts we played was fun. Mm-hmm. Okay, other side of the coin. This is not on the outline, so you know we we didn't study huh? this. But Are we yep, going off not, script? We're, we're going, going off, off script. script. Oh no! <laughs> so what about GMing successes? Can you name one or maybe two cabin con uh, sessions or games you thought, man, that was a real success? For me, was the, the last cabin con. Oh, that last was, year, I believe. Yes, no. Let me think. Must have been. Mm-hmm. Whichever one, if it was the last one or the one before, I played um, a. Um, it was Pathfinder. Okay. And it was a an arena game. Fun. So um, I must have been the the, the previous, not uh, yeah. When was the one before? Yeah. The one before last. So in it with the arena, uh, it's a magical construct dungeon. So cool. um, that's how the arena is run. It's a magical construct. I mean, you walk out into uh, a typical arena, but monsters and locations and whatnot are magically constructed. Um, I... So in this, it took that to the to 11. So cool. most of the rooms were uh, uh, amalgams of various uh, uh, things that don't go together. Like uh, I had, uh, and I took this from a cue from you from a story you told about a game you went were in where there was a uh, one of those, not a shark, the the, the uh, land shark. Not a land shark. It's the uh, uh, a wa- underwater creature that showed up in a dungeon. Was your oh, story. Oh, Abeleth. <laughs> so, right. So, but the DM just went with it. So what I did was I had a few rooms. At one room in particular, the environment was kind of like soupy air. You could get through it. You could almost swim in it. But the creatures that you're fighting were all, were all aquatic. Oh, dude. Yeah, players were talking about that game. They yeah. loved it. Yeah, so I... um. Because the arena characters were really uh, min-maxed and had a lot of magic items, uh, I decided to have an environment where they had some really harsh penalties. And I didn't want to pick on any particular kind of ability. I just said, uh, I just kind of spitballed it. So cool. the, the, uh, the characters were in a sort of air, sort of water. They could breathe. They didn't need to have any water breathing spells or effects or anything to, to exist. Right. Um, but the their opponents swam around like they're in water. So they had an advantage. Uh, missile weapons were, were penalized. Movement was slow. Um, so it set up a pretty cool environment. And then uh, another room, the 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 one thing there were a couple of invisible opponents that were constantly moving. Oh, wow. That's yeah, that's tough. Right. And, um, so it was a fighter given, uh, with a, um, allied with a wizard that was flying. So if the, the fighter needed uh, like a spell a protection spell cast on it, that, that wizard was there to do that. And it wasn't, no attack spells. I'll so, just I'll just buff the fighter. Yeah. Sweet. And he but didn't really need, love that. <laughs> right. Well, because he was kind of a clone of Butch. Oh, gee, oh gosh. So uh, Butch, but, by, Butch, by the way, guys, is uh, Joe's total BA twelfth level. Is that right? Uh, I think we converted him to fifth edition, and now he's thirteenth. Yeah, he is. Oh, he's a terror. He got to 10th level in Pathfinder and then the bottom dropped out of Pathfinder and it's for us and uh, convert him to fifth. I tried to convert him to 13th age and that just didn't feel good. He was 10th level and he played more like a 15th level character, put it that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was pretty tough and he was uh, ridiculous. So it was a pretty tough fighter with a wizard buddy that kept buff spells on him while being <laughs> invisible and then making him invisible too. I bet it, they love that. Oh, that was fun. 
So, yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I, it's gosh, you know, I, I run so much. Uh, it's hard for they all run together. I would say that last year being the most recent, just from the fact that I looked around at the table during the sci-fi game you and I have talked about before, uh, Moons of Oblivion for Savage Worlds, it was mostly RP, but I didn't see anybody bored. They didn't seem bored from, I, I didn't think even for a minute during that game. And we had like half a fight. For your Star Wars game? No, that science, the sci-fi game. Remember that? The sci-fi yeah, game last year? That was excellent. Yeah, because everybody was – and the only way I can judge it is everybody was really into it. And I was like, man – and I was having a blast. And I was like, this is just not something I would expect where we have, like, you know, barely a little bit of a fight and everybody's just really into the game. It was really – I can't take credit for the adventure other than running it, but I didn't write it. It was really cool. Well, I think it was a confluence of um, things. Um, we're all friends. Sure. We're all into sci-fi to one degree or another. Yep. I think that we have a, a an aliens vibe amongst us. So, uh, right. so when we were in the uh, in the adventure, which was pretty close to throwing a bunch of non-combat folks into uh, LV four two six, kind of yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we had to act like that. Right. It was fun. And it was, uh, very identifiable because we in real life wouldn't be able to handle either situation except no. the way we did, I think, by avoiding contact. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I would say for a new GM, I mean, modules can save your bacon. Uh, not that I needed my bacon saved, just that I think it can help you run a good story and be more cohesive. But to be truthful, I did a lot of my own in that. But even if you didn't, it's a good, a good module can definitely make you look like a better GM. Yeah, it can. A well, a well-made module. Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. So yeah, that okay. was a definite uh, high point, I think, along the whole the whole um, cabin con trajectory. I think maybe because it's so close. You know, something I'm, else. Like three or four cabin cons ago, it was right around my. I think my second. We we're still running Elysium. I was doing my Cormon, Thirteenth Age Cormon, and I had several people comment. I don't know. Dave said he liked it. Where I ran. Remember, I ran like these two or three scenarios. I ran them all three times. So I had like twelve. 15 players run through each scenario. And so for running each scenario three times, I decided that depending on the results, that if two out of those, so if we had a scenario one yeah. and, I, and I ran it three times, if two of those three times resulted in you guys say saving the day, then that's what happened in our shared campaign world. Yeah, that was good. And if two or of the three scenarios ended up you guys not saving the day, then that's what happened. And we had both good and bad outcomes because I remember I came back and said, oh, the sword was lost. And you and Dave both go, wait a minute, we recovered it. And I said, you were the only group that did. And they're like, oh, so the story was the sword was lost. <laughs> remember that? that there's a there is a um, there is a deeper meaning to that story. Oh, really? that Dave and I are the superior players. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't want to say it in front of everybody, but since it you did. I think more Dave than I, but. That's Dave a, is, uh, Dave's pretty good, dude. He's tactically sound. Yes, yes, yes. I think okay. another, another one of mine might've been, um, you, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when you and, and Philip and I, we're just running games for each other, just the three of us. That was and, awesome. <laughs> that was fun. And people got jealous. Because so, it was fun. It was fun. But the one that I ran you two in yeah. another arena, and you two, you know, skin of your teeth, right? Oh, it, dude, it, yeah. It. We had uh, Tanakh, my warlock, and then our witch and Pathfinder. And what was – his was a paladin. Um, he's a – like a cardinal or something, but his paladin's awesome. It was cool. It was a very good game. Right. So Yeah, I think that was very cool. And that was nice having just, we had two players in a GM, and I think we were just in the mood, and it just really hit a home run. Right. Again, I'm just going to say that you have the right chemistry between players. Yep. 
the scenario I ran was not deep by any stretch of the imagination. I had some quirky things that happened in there, and it, the rest of the fun was us just riffing off each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. <sighs> riffing. So, anyway. Were you trying to segue with riff? I suck at it, so you got to seg me. So we're going, we are riffing to a better gaming world. <laughs> no, that blows. Randy, you suck. So anyway, let's go to the last segment here, I think. Building a better gaming world. Still keeping with the theme of new new GMs. Um, you know, we're, I, I've got uh, me and Pat, and I feel, and I don't know, Joe, I, I'm, I'm implementing some of the ideas. I'm, you probably noticed that you, that you talked about months ago that you'd like to see in a world. And we're running um, a West Marches style game. I'll put that in quotations. Um, maybe I'll explain what that is in a minute. Me and me and Pat, the guy that was here last week, and it's meant to be a new setting, a new world, a shared world for our uh, players to play in. And right now, I'm running what I call the test drive of it, with you know what we played this past weekend. Um, for a new GM, how do you make a setting or a game? I would say let's stick with setting friendly. So to me, I think the West Marches style is great because it's super flexible. It's wide open. You're not tied to a lot of different different things that have to happen. The cannon can be loose. And our plan, my plan, is the, the rules system will be completely flexible. You can use whatever system you want whenever you run in the new Valasia West Marches game. Right. So I think um, open and flexible are key to a... Um newbie friendly or anybody friendly uh, setting uh, in that you don't use game jargon. Right. Or as little as possible. There's some, right. there's some uh, words because it's a fantasy game uh, setting. If it's a fantasy game system, there may be some overlap in terminology, but right. uh, as long as you keep it uh, that down to as much as possible, um, you just make it as engaging as you can from a story point of view. Um, I think that you don't go too overboard on details and um, exhaustive history of a particular location or yep. genealogies or too many NPCs. You probably hit the high, or you probably, it might even be good just to have an introductory chapter or three where it hits the highlights uh, of a few regions within the setting, depending on how big it is. Um, yeah, m m my intention. A town. Yes, it could be. And then, and then uh, that could be the introductory uh, chapter to a setting would be the a town, and then um, uh, you just make it engaging, like you would if you're writing a novel, perhaps. Uh, yeah. But you and you don't get too jargony. Yeah, and that, that's what I'm trying was trying to do last session. I want to get you to the quote unquote town. Um, but again, I prep too much. It's okay. It makes it fun for the, for us. It's fine. But to, to match a West Marshes style, the idea is at cabin con, you go on an adventure and you come back to town. So your characters are not going to be lost somewhere in a dungeon at the end of the session. You got to go out, come back and do that. Now in our, in our current, in our, in a, in our play test version, I call it play test. Cause you know, we're just trying it out. It uh, doesn't matter because we're going to meet bi-weekly and we're going to pick up and play wherever we're at the same characters. But at Cabin Con, you know, I might have three guys one time, five guys the next, and then different four guys the third time. So I need to be able to get them out there and back so they can kind of talk about what they've done as they explore this new wild land, which is the idea. Right. Yeah, the whole going out and coming back into town is kind of a archetypal story structure um, where the hero goes and goes out into the wild and either rescues the maiden mm -hmm. or defeats the evil monster, finds the treasure, brings the treasure back to town, shares the treasure so that um, society is bettered. Yeah, and there's going to be a, a component, even in our campaign setting, even in our campaign play, this we're doing now, where you're going to go explore and you're going to come back and report. I don't mean necessarily to the government, but you're going to keep track of something. 
And I would like for other groups to be able to take advantage of that. In a classic West Marches game, there's a map somewhere that the players add to, hey, we explored the weeping monolith and here's what we saw. And, you know, the next time a group goes, it could be even this, because this is where at CabinCon especially, I hope not to do this in our, in our regular campaign, but at CabinCon, I want to leave up the option. Of, there may be TPKs. Hey, this is where... Joe's character and Phil's character and Josh's and Pat's went out to do a thing and they never came back. Right. So that's dangerous there. Yeah, exactly. That's a dangerous place. And, you know, even as players, you I mean, I'd be OK with you, like looking at another player and say, yeah, we got our butts handed to us. And we, I don't think we should have went there. The warning signs were there, but we screwed up. And so I would not suggest you take your third level characters and try to go back and check out what we did. At least not now. I ain't going back to ninth level. Right. Yeah. It does make it a little meta, but I think it's still fun. That's an element that's fun. It makes the world feel shared at Cabin Con, which is what we're shooting for, without really super tight storylines, because we've seen how that's really difficult with multiple GMs. Well, yeah, and in our the real world, that kind of stuff happened. I mean, how many expeditions have not come back from uh, historically? All right. Ex- have pl- plan- been planned, have um, gone off the, uh, to where they were supposed to go, and were never seen from, or yep. heard, seen, a, seen or heard from again. Those that travel 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 to the New World during Columbus times, and those or that the dark the pilgrim- Yeah, gosh, to Africa. Wow, yeah. Yep, what yep. a mess. Yeah. Or mountain climbing, or to the uh, the Great White North. You yep. know, all those all all those places have had lots of expeditions where people didn't come back or maybe one or two people survived and yep. and, and oh, were never the same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a trope. That's a good trope to have. Not necessarily encouraging you to kill many, uh, having many TPKs, but. Right. Sure. Yeah, I'm just saying, as I know, I don't want to, but I want that to be an option. You know, like I told you, we talked about, I, you know me, I try to telegraph if your players are going off into towards something that's very dangerous. Like, you know, you're level two, just so you know, there's rumors of a mind flayer and we're, we're still heading there. Why are you? OK, did you hear what I said? There's rumors right. of mind flayers. OK, we're going. OK, so what you're telling me is you want me to murder the whole party. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you want. OK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a player, if I'm playing in a group, it was like kind of like that one with Philip where we were trying to figure out what we're going to do with the pirate guy. And uh, I was really I ended up just going along with the group. Right. And you weren't too gung ho about it. No, I was not. And it ended up not being the right decision. But, you know. (laughs) Yep. Just like in real life, you don't know all the details, so you have right. to make the best call you can. Right. And so you, you ended up being right, but it really didn't matter. We got it our didn't budget matter. to I us. Didn't, didn't have an alternate line no. of approach. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We did what we could. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, right. try a little uh, shameless pluggery here. We right. would ask you ask you guys to please share, like, or review our podcast on Anchor, Breaker, Apple iTunes. Spotify, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. Yes, and uh, if you'd like to support uh, support our show, uh, please check out our website at www.biggestgeekestpodcast.com and click on the don't uh, the uh, support <laughs> tab. Someone still has not changed their <laughs> note structure. Gosh, uh, this our outline guy sucks. Yes, we need to fire that dude. I think so too. Um, yes, click on the support tab, different page. Uh, you could even just go to biggestgeekestpodcast.com slash support. Yes. There are many options there. Um, and we will support, we will, um, appreciate any kind of contribution you can make, even yep. if it's just uh, sharing. And Absolutely. If you, yeah. And if you have any questions, email us at questions at biggestgeekestpodcast.com. I am considering, um, biggest geekest podcast is an awfully long URL. It um, is BG. And, yeah, I couldn't get biggestgeekest.com. Okay, yeah, reason. you said that. Mm-hmm. Said that, but I could get biggestgeekest.net 
or .co mm. or some other thing. Mm. I might, I'm going to consider that. Consider. We need, we need to talk about it. We do. That's, we need All to right. talk, dude. We must have a talk. The talk. Yes. Sort of. All right. Well, this is Randy. And I'm Joe. Remember, can't be big like us, then be geeks like us. <laughs>